As the foremost flat earther on the globe today, I have been asked many times, how does science suppresses the truth, meaning the flat earth truth? And that is a fair question and it needs to be answered. So I decided to tackle it. So let's go back to the beginning, very beginning, where it all started. They tell us that a Greek man called Pythagoras was the first person to think of the earth as a globe. They also tell us that Pythagoras went to Egypt to further his studies. And whilst he was there, the Babylonians invaded Egypt and took him back to Babylon as a prisoner. Babylon is a modern day Iraq. And what the history books omit to tell us is that Pythagoras was fucked up the arse every single day by the Babylonian uh, battalion. No, strike that. Regiment. No, sorry. The whole Babylonian army took turns to fuck him up the arse. And all that semen seeped into his brain. And he started to hallucinate about bowls. And he looked up the sky and saw all the stars and other luminaries and thought, yeah, they're all balls. I love, I love balls. And so began the ball earth spinning basketball in the vacuum of space theory. And it gained momentum ever since. Funnily enough, in the same history books about Pythagoras, they tell us that there is no existing works or books written by him. And it seems to me that most of the stories are all made up. The same is true of Aristarchus of Samos. He dreamt up the heliocentric model where he placed the sun in the middle and the planets revolving around it. Again, they tell us that no surviving written works exist of Aristarchus. Surprise, surprise, the same is said of Eratosthenes who apparently figured out the radius of the earth from Alexandria in Egypt and he counted the, the camel steps that uh, went to Syene and back. What a lord of bollocks. Again, they say no written work exists of Eratosthenes. Then we come to Nicolaus Copernicus of Poland. In 1543, he published a book called De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, which is translated as On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. But the funny thing is, there is no evidence that the luminaries we see are spheres. And everybody combined to promote his work and we have been living on his model ever since. In 1660, King Charles II of England by charter created the Royal Society. Really, they should be called the Royal Society of Freemasons. They admit that they were trying to prove the Copernicus model, or rather the Copernican model. 
After John Flamsteed, Edmund Halley became the second astronomer royal. Edmund Halley plotted many stars in the southern hemisphere. Sorry, strike that. Southern hemisplane. And he also did a lot of work on the latitude and longitudes along the Atlantic Ocean. The problem here is that they were assuming a globe and using globe earth math in quotation marks. If you start from a false premise and a shaky foundation, then you are really boxing yourself in. You are being exclusive rather than, rather than being inclusive. Halley was also a close friend of James Bradley, who later became the third Astronomer Royal. In 1729, James Bradley claimed that he had found stellar aberration of the stars and nutation, which is the slight uneven nodding of the Earth axis caused by the changing direction of the gravitational pull of the Moon. Again, they are assuming a globe Earth. The aberration is simply refraction of light which causes the stars to appear slightly away from where they should be, should be seen. And he was actually looking for stellar parallax, which he couldn't find. Bradley documented that he had to tilt his teles telescope to capture the starlight and claimed the reason for this is that the Earth is at motion. However, this phenomenon can be explained rationally by saying that the, that the starlight in the medium of the ether is moving, not the Earth. About 150 years after Bradley published his paper on stellar aberration, another astronomer royal and fellow of the Royal Society, George Biddle Airy, conducted the same experiment in 1871. His experiment became famous and is known today as Aries failure after he failed to detect the motion of the Earth. Now, some people say that it's known as Aries failure because he failed to detect the ether, but that is preposterous because the heliocentrists did not believe in the ether they dismissed it. So it is folly to say that he was trying to find the ether. Aries' documented work shows that he expected a figure of 30 arc seconds, but he could only find 0.8 arc seconds. This proved that the Earth was not moving. Aries' experiment proved that the Earth was stationary and the starlight in the ether was moving. In 1887, Michelson and Morley conducted their famous experiment where they tried to prove the motion of the Earth. They passed two beams of light one at the direction of travel of the Earth and the other at right angles to the direction of travel. Their hypothesis was that they would find the Earth moving around the Sun at 30 kilometers per second, but they only managed to measure 1 to 10 kilometers per second. Once again, they proved that the Earth was stationary. In 1913, Georges Sagnac 
carried out an experiment of passing lights in opposite directions around the table and then recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the table at two revolutions per second and found the fringes had changed. When the table is turned, the light that travels with the split with the spin takes slightly longer to reach its target than the light that is going against the spin of the table, meaning that the table is coming towards the light and so is the table. However, relativity says that both lights traveling in opposite directions should reach its target at the same time. This means that both lights reach the photo photographic place at different times. This changes the fringe pattern. This proves the existence of the ether and the starlight moves through this medium. The same effect is used in modern aircraft using either ring laser gyro or fiber optic gyro, which detect the changes in the direction of the airplane. The Earth cannot be moving. In 1925, Michelson and Gale set up an experiment to see if they could detect the rotation of the Earth on its one revolution per day. They set up a very large rectangle of 12 inch diameter tubes in a field with a light source and mirrors at the corners. The light travelled in opposite directions around the rectangle and then recombined, giving movements which were only 2.6% different from what they expected would be the result, or one revolution per day. Now, if we transfer this experiment onto a large-scale globe, then we will see that the Earth should move nearly 25,000 miles in one revolution at the equator, and decreases as we move further up north. At the North Pole, the movement is actually zero. So imagine that the south arm was at the equator and the north arm was at 30 degrees north. When the light is recombined, they will produce a different fringe result. From 269 observations, they only obtained an average change of 0 0.230 fringe, which was only a 2.6% difference of what they expected. This experiment clearly proved that the Earth was stationary and that it was the ether that was moving. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the Earth is flat and stationary. Thank you very much.